My name is Ruth Penfold Brown and I am currently residing in just outside Atlanta in the US of A. I am a new person here um, and I am heavily involved in people, culture, talent, leadership and that has been my entire journey today, a bit like you Matt. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking that when we first met years ago in London, you there's been such a common thread f that I see in you from that point all the way through to now, which is you're always so generous in giving to the community, like what you're learning, because you acknowledge your, like there's no one way of doing it and you never said, right, this is the way we're going to do it. But from the beginning, from those events we attended and the 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 times we met and have mutual friends um you've been so generous so i really appreciate that about you and your journey of people and culture oh wow that is such a wonderful thing to hear and you know what where my brain went as you were saying it i've accidentally open sourced my development i think <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, oh, I've learned this thing. Hey, here, maybe let see if it it's going to work for you and see if it's going to help you in any way or um and it just I don't know as as you're discovering that there's this an easier way or a way that you can work that feels more sustainable, that feels better, that you can grow bigger in then I guess, yeah, I feel like it's almost like your moral obligation to to share it, you know? You seem to love the work you do now. Can do. you share, what is that? Like, what work do you do? Okay, so I do two things, but I'll start with the, I'll start with like the big beating heart <laughs> part first, right? Is that... Um, about well so i sort of i i left my last full-time role with actually not knowing really what i wanted to do next i was already um starting to coach people and work with people in that way and i could feel myself moving in that direction um but I, so i started to sort of coach people and i was delivering some workshops and designing some workshops for different people and then it was last summer so it's actually so summer 2022 um, I was like, but what do I want to do? You know, I'd been kind of self-employed, I guess, for almost a year. And it was like, yeah, but what do I want to do? And my husband asked me the question, who, if you could do anything, anything at all, who would you serve? Who would you want to help? And I, out of, it, literally without even thinking about it, said, I would help women like me learn how to love themselves and value themselves sooner. And so Bloom, which is the thing that I have now created 18 months later, is literally my life's work. It's the coming together of all of those sharings and learnings. And it is, it's a leadership accelerator and community specifically for women in HR, who I know have experienced many of the things that I experience. And I've basically, I guess, curated and codified all of my learnings into um you know an, an an accelerator that takes people on the journey from you know undervalued and overworked to confidently claiming their role in their career whatever that means for them right um and so so yeah i'm really excited by where the business is now and really focusing on serving the community that I've, I guess, tried to serve for such a long time. Two, two of the things that stood out to me there. First is you started, you said you start with a beating heart and that's so you because it like is to do with love and to do with like body and like, yeah, like thinking about the human and the body. So I love that you started with that beating heart. And secondly, um, can we give a shout out to Devon for the question, uh, if you could do anything, what would you want to do? Who would you like to serve? Yeah. And do you know what? It's such a powerful question. He asked himself the same question about 15 years ago. Now, now Devon is an event MC for anybody listening, right? And that's what he does. And about 15 years ago-ish, he was driving along, maybe it's slightly longer, um, and he was he he asked himself this question, and that what flashed into his brain was MC Hammer meets Tony Robbins, 
And he was like, that's ridiculous. Like, what? That What even is that? And then not even, like, in the next couple of years, he was starting to be invited to host events. And, le- and within no time at all, he was sharing the stage with Tony Robbins. And he dances like MC Hammer versus... <laughs> Versus actually being like MC Hammer. But I guess I say that, folks, just because whatever wild ideas your brain has when you ask it this question, trust it. What do you believe influences things, whether things happen or not? So I hear a lot about manifesting, for example, or envisioning, or like, do you believe in that? If so, what is it? Or is it fate? Or what do you believe in that influences whether things happen or not? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I would say that I definitely believe in fate. Like real talk, I'm just going to get spiritual with you because why not? It's I, This is almost like a hold my earrings moment. <laughs> I'm just going to get spiritual with you. I honestly believe that everything is divine, right? I think that it unfolds as it's meant to in life so that we get to experience the things that maybe we need to experience so that our soul can heal from whatever it needed to heal from before, right? And that is what I truly believe. And so if I look back on my own life, and this is where my evidence comes from, Matt, right? It's like, if I look back on my moments of of intense hardship, then they have always led to this beautiful, bright new dawn, like, and, and my life has been so much bigger and I've been able to be bolder because I've had those experiences. So I've learned to very much view, I guess, joy and pain as different sides of the same coin and understand that to really experience joy, you gotta feel a bit of pain. So, you know, yes, I definitely am deeply spiritual and I believe in fate um and but i also think that we are we are the master of our like you can choose to learn the lessons that fate is giving you that whatever you believe in source is giving you the opportunity to learn you can choose to learn them or you can choose to ignore it and not (laughs) like literally it's up to you i mean maybe like me you might have started noticing that maybe the same character keeps repeating themselves in your life and it's like hmm, maybe there's something that I need to address with this character in order to evolve my experience. Um, And so, yeah, uh, I don't know. What do you think? Throwing that back on you, what's your your take on it all? I recently have been looking even more into nature as... uh, to, to learn from so I'm not I'm not sure I have the answer now uh, for the question but what I am looking at is I'm trying to really learn a lot about okay we are pe- we are humans in nature and nature there's a lot to it um, there's so much complexity there's so much lightness and darkness so trying to I'm trying to study and learn from nature to learn how better to better respond to some of the stuff that happens mm, I love that I love that and ultimately that is we are nature, right? So um, if we can all just accept that and, and live in that way, then um, you know that's the reason why we feel great when we go into nature and, and around all of, the, all of these beautiful gifts on the earth. It's because you know, it really is part of, part of us, it's who we are. Yeah. Thank you for asking that one. So let talk, considering fate then, let's look at the fate of your journey in people, teams and mm. culture work. So can you share, before we get on to some of the specific questions that I'm keen to get your perspective on, I'm keen to understand, okay, well, what's your path been in the, the people and culture space? Can you share a few of yeah. uh, the moments on your journey? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely can. So like many people, I didn't necessarily choose recruitment, but recruitment chose me. Um, And I like to think of it as water flowing through the path of least resistance, right? And so I flowed into recruitment and found that I was, I had a gift for getting to know people and getting to understand their motivations. and, And so I spent about 13 years agency side in recruitment. At which point, um, somewhere actually 
somewhere around that time, just before then, I actually um, left my ex-husband and got divorced and completely started my life over again. So that's one of these big, big sort of seasons of pain that then gave way to this sort of a beautiful new dawn, right? And um, at around that time, I was asking myself again, like, okay, well, what do I want? What do I want to do? Where, where am I at? It was definitely one of those moments. And I didn't know what I wanted, Matt. So I decided instead, I'm just going to look out into the world and see which humans feel interesting to me. And I'm going to see if I can get to know them. And that's what I did. And my next career moves, therefore, came out of that network that I'd been creating. And one of those people, uh, a chap called Ryan Broad, ended up being at Shazam. And he was like, hey, I don't know what you're doing right now, but you need to come here. And it was literally like a three month or six week, I can't remember the, di like very short assignment. But I was like, you know what? I just had this feeling like it was going to be something that I could use. Uh, to really a place where I could really build and grow, and and I got the I got that role, and I managed to also secure um, the permanent role in the end, and uh, become their first uh, first ever permanent talent acquisition director. Um, so I kind of it was it was a sort of wonderful a series of fortunate events. Um, and that was somewhere I stayed for almost five years. And I really loved, I loved the environment. I still feel deeply connected to the people at Shazam, um, which is really interesting um, to be however many years later. I mean, it was 2018, I left there. I left when we sold to Apple. And at the time I could see there could have been an opportunity for me with Apple, but it would meant that my horizon would have got smaller and at that time I was I, I had expanded my role to cover the sort of culture side I was I was in, dealing with internal communications I was involved in employee engagement I was you know I was kind of expand learning and development I was expanding my remit and I could just feel my horizon closing with Apple um, so I decided to leave and at that point took a VP people role with Onfido now that was a big leap, right? That's another big leap. It's uh, it's going from talent acquisition director, essentially, to heading up a people team of 15. And again, folks, I got to make that leap because of people, because I'd gotten to know people and they could, they knew me, they knew my energy. And they were like, if there's one person that we want to come in and do this role, it's you. <laughs> And so that's how that happened. And then my, fi my, my next role and my final employed role, for now at least, um, was with uh, BP Launchpad. And that was as chief people officer, essentially setting up a business for the first time, which was owned by BP, but was set up to be separate from BP. And that was a whole other cultural case study in... <laughs> And actually, I should also say that, you know, you know, we started with my beating heart. The other side of the work that I do is still part of my heart. And that's I work with companies on their culture and their leadership and all of the things that help us all to be great together. So, so yeah, that's basically, that was my little whistle stop tour. <laughs> yeah, it really shows the power of the network. And I, I believe that... Um... I remember watching an interview. I don't even think it's online anymore, but it was um, Noel Gallagher being interviewed by for some Adidas thing. And one of the things he said was along the lines of, all you can, like there's so much out of your control in the music business. Like if you play drums, all you can do is be like the best drum player that you can be so that when somebody, and like, I guess, help people be able to discover your, you. But so when someone does discover you, they can see how great, a drum player you are um mm. and yeah it's a similar thing with you so you've kind of learned and developed yourself and your skills in an open source way um but your power of the network like the power of the network has really helped you i've got a question about that which is so you seem to be i don't know you have a strong linkedin game um you seem someone who does it a lot and seems to do it well, seems to be comfortable, confident. Um, I don't know how much of that is um, 
you like is accurate but that's my sense of it um if someone listening or watching wants to like things okay i believe in the power of the network like it's it's shown itself for you but they're not they haven't necessarily got to the stage of linkedin uh use that you have what what, like what's your what do you what do you offer them is it okay well you you do you or you do you and try this bit extra or like actually just do it even if it's not you don't feel it's you at the moment you I don't know like on that spectrum and there's so many options what are your thoughts what would you say to someone so I would say this is where so part of what we learn in bloom there's lots of different components right but part of it um you know well, we start out with who you are and why you are, and we help you fall in love with who that is, um, because I promise you, you're magical, right? Um, then, but one of the other components that I want to get to is we help you overcome perfectionism by starting to view everything as an experiment, right? And that's really, I think, with anything like this. So, yes, I have been very active on LinkedIn for a while. Um, but my background was as a recruiter. So it's very normal for me to reach out to people on LinkedIn and you have to, if you've been in recruitment, you have to have built that muscle, right? You have to be okay with it, reaching out to someone and going, Hey, I think you're awesome. Can we talk? So I've just carried on a version of that, but I will say that right till today, I reach out to new people multiple times a week on LinkedIn to connect. I'm often, I probably in a normal week have about three calls with people that I've never spoken to before. It's just how I roll. So if you're not comfortable doing that right now, um, I'm, I can't tell you, I, I think it is such an excellent way of connecting with people. And all I can say to you is, well, first of all, you can connect with me, right? Um, and I will not say no, you are safe, right? Second of all, um, if you're reaching out to someone that you find interesting like I did, and I, and all you're saying to them is, I think you're really interesting and your career looks brilliant and I would love to hear more about you and how you got there. If they say no, it's usually a bandwidth thing because all you're doing is complimenting them. So it feels great. It feels wonderful when someone reaches out to me and said, wow, I love this thing that you did. Uh, if possible, can can we grab a call sometime? Now, I, my door is always open for those sorts of things. I know some people work differently and that's okay. Um, but do know if someone says no, it's probably a bandwidth thing. And the other thing I wanna say, uh, and it's actually something a friend of mine was talking about the other day. If you're new to LinkedIn, And at the moment, you're like a watcher, right? There's nothing wrong with, first of all, being a watcher. But maybe the way that you can start to dip your toe in is by starting to comment meaningfully on other people's posts. Um, Now, there's a lot of AI that can comment for you. I would avoid that, personally, because what we're trying to do here is not just, I, I guess, find the cheat codes and think that we've ticked a box. What we want to do is have you start to flex the muscle of using your voice and it will build up just like a muscle in the gym over time until you're like, do you know what? I feel like I could write a post because I didn't pop out somebody posting and blogging and like the first time I blogged, I absolutely was terrified. The first time I tweeted, I was terrified. Then I got obsessed with tweeting. Um, and then same all the way, all of these different guess, I guess, things that, you know, these frontiers, when I first podcasted, I was like, ah, you know, it was terrifying. When I first went live on LinkedIn, it was terrifying. You know, like all of the firsts can be really scary, but once you do a little bit of it, then you, and you don't, and you realize you didn't die and you were okay and that you live to tell the tale, um, then I don't know, like for me, that was the journey. That was the journey. So I know I absolutely was not always this way. <laughs> it's, I think it's really helpful to hear just um, how someone else has done it. So thank you for sharing your journey and your experience. Well, I know it'd be different for everyone else. Um, I'd love to talk. So you mentioned in Bloom that there's a leadership accelerator. Is that right? Yes. 
So when our community, when we're looking at shaping culture and the people experience, leadership is such a one of the main topics that comes up. And leadership and management are terms that don't necessarily have like one definition that everyone understands. So could you share from your perspective what what does leadership mean and if you're on a leadership accelerator what does that mean you're what is what are you accelerating towards yeah yeah oh i love that question and uh the simplest way that i would describe it is leadership is an energy it is not a role right now you can become a leader long before you're ever leading anybody and i don't know about the listeners but my guess is that maybe you probably have known that you're a leader your whole life somewhere, right? That you're meant to to move things forward, to change things, to evolve things, to make them better. Honestly, I, it's very hard to find someone in people, culture, uh, and any of those realms that isn't driven in that way, right? To make things better. And so if you look at the difference, I think management is managing some it's the managing of a series of circumstances whereas leadership is is by the fact that it's an energy it means that i can lead situations without necessarily needing to be somebody's boss and by the time i then become somebody's boss then my energy hopefully has so evolved in this leadership way that i then don't need to do the management necessarily maybe only sometimes if something comes up that's unexpected, but for the most part, that you can literally just set the set a foundation with people that means that they are their own autonomous, free thinking beings in your team, and that 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 they are also leaders and leading energy within the organization. Do you see what I mean? It's sort of like a contagious thing. So Bloom being a leadership accelerator is really about self-leadership turning into the way we lead organizations, right? So self-leadership that covers, first of all, how we see ourselves in relation to others in the workplace, which let's face it, for a lot of people, we see ourselves as less than, as lower than. And my mission is to change that because what where we've been getting it wrong, Matt, is that we're looking at everybody else at that leadership table and thinking, oh, I don't belong there. But that's the whole point. We don't belong there right now. But just imagine how many other people like us feel like they don't belong because we don't belong, right? So actually, if if companies are truly going to transform, then they need different brains and different energy in that decision-making group. Because we are such a heart-led sector of beings, I honestly believe that it is up to us to shift the energy in the companies that we're in and open the door for more people like us to come through. Let's say somebody is the leader of a people function in a company and there is an executive team who like might be the CEO, the COO, uh, chief sales officer. So there's a few people on the executive team and the leader of the people function is not on the executive team. And it's pretty clear that the power dynamic is one that the the people person is seen as just deliver on this stuff. And they're not they're not viewed and kind of their their power is not equal. How much should that people person try and influence it so they are viewed at a more of a level so they're not having to try and always convince or try and influence how much should they try and change that dynamic how much should they acknowledge that okay the stage that this company is in it's going to be really difficult for those exec team to change their mindset around this and my energy is just it's i should accept more that that's just the nature of the power of this role I realize it's not that binary, but kind of how would you go around a situation like that for the people person? Yeah. That was quite a complex one that we've not prepared. No, 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 no. It's what came to mind. But I, I, I feel you and I understand what you're asking. And I would, so here's the thing for all of us, we've got to know, right, when it's worth investing our energy 
and when it's not, right? And the question therefore that comes up for me is one of fear versus intuition, right? So your intuition can trust you, right? So, so when I first moved to America a year ago, it was really hard. It was hard being here. And I had also visa processes happening that meant I couldn't come home to the UK and I couldn't visit. And my fear was saying, this is too hard. This is too hard. This is too hard. My intuition, the steady voice deep down in my belly was like, you're in the right place. You just have to ride this out. You're in the right place. So you've constantly got these two opposing forces, the brain versus the intuition, right? Fear is ultimately the brain's way of trying to keep you safe. So you are the only person that can become the filter for which is appropriate here. But I will say that when you're in a place where intuitively you know that you can create an impact, then you have to work on your fear because your fear is gonna give you legitimate reasons why not to have that conversation with that person, why it's a really terrible idea to do X, Y, Z, why you absolutely shouldn't put your hand up for this thing here, right? And um, that's what fear will do. And if you listen to fear, you will stay frustrated just outside that table where they respect you, but not enough. And you can feel it, right? Now, this is where, unfortunately, we need to be the leaders. We need to be those who are rising up and saying, do you know what? Yes, I am different to you, but I, diff I am equally excellent and our organization, our organization needs all of our energy if we're gonna win. Um, and that means, you know, in my own case, I, uh, one of the environments that I, I worked in was incredibly ta challenging culturally. Um, but my intuition didn't say leave, it said stay, even though my brain was going, get out of here. Uh. But at the time I was at least able to consciously say, well, this is gonna be a great case study, no matter what happens. So let's roll with it and see where we go. And I had to have multiple conversations with other executives around our relationship and my experience of our relationship. And, um, you know, and really it was acknowledging our difference and it was saying, hey, we're clearly quite different thinkers and quite different people. So how can we actually use that as a strength versus a weakness? Because right now it's a weakness for us. So it means, it does though mean stepping outside of yourself and your own personal reactions if somebody is giving you the vibes that they think either that they don't like you or frankly that they think you're stupid because that's definitely the vibe that I've had from from the sort of much more is it right brain that's creative and left brained that isn't I can't I never remember whichever whichever is the opposite to the creative one like the that I am when I'm when I met with those thinkers I can feel we can we're empaths we can feel how people feel right so it's almost helping them to overcome their biases for people that they think potentially aren't as valuable as they are. I think the um, that looking through the lens of fear and intuition is such a useful like approach. Um, this is possibly getting spiritual again. Um, Always. Well, when did we when did we go off spiritual? Yeah. <laughs> but where where does what, like what is intuition? Where does it come from? Mm. If someone's like, how do I know what my intuition is? Is it just a thought like what comes to me like is yeah. it a feeling I get when I think of something yeah the, I would best describe it as so um and it's something I often talk about when I'm teaching meditation and things like that um is that you have to we think that we are our brain but we're not your brain is one organ in your body amongst many right but it's the brain it's the thing that talks to you all the time so we think that that's who we are. But if you get really still within yourself, I'm going to wonder whether, and many people that I've worked with can, can begin to establish a difference, that there's actually this very wise, wise old sage that's actually sitting behind 
all of the reaction in your brain, right? Now, that's what I call your intuition. And for me, I like to think about it as living down in my stomach, not in my brain, right? And people are often talking about the connection between the brain and the stomach and the body and all the rest of it, right? Um, but I like to think of my intuition as living there. And it's almost like the seat of my soul, right? And that's why actually in Bloom, we start with things like values because when we know who we are and what matters to us, ultimately the thing that's guiding you in your values most of the time is your intuition. So if you know what your values are and then you can start to, it, they literally give you a decision-making model to go, mm, does this take me away from my values or can I be my values if I do this thing? Can I still be my values and do this? And that is a really powerful way to bring it into the real world. And then as you start to develop rhythms that really serve you, then, then you can probably get to the place where you're like, mm, my intuition is saying stay. <laughs> or, you know, it's my fear. And what I now do with my fear as well, which, which um, people might want to try is I literally go, thank you, brain. I know you're trying to protect me right now, but I'm okay, we've got this. I'm just, I'm just gonna launch a podcast. I'm just gonna write a post on LinkedIn. I'm just gonna, you know, we're okay. But thank you for caring about me enough that you wanna keep me safe, but we're gonna be safe if we do this. I think you've come up with two titles for podcast series. Um, the Seat of My Soul. I don't know if that's a thing already, but that's a great one. And the other one was, um, it's gonna be a great case study, no matter what happens. That's a brilliant <laughs> series, I reckon. <laughs> Um, there's one bit I didn't quite get. So what's the relationship in your, like the way you see it between your values, your personal values and intuition? Does intuition leap like influence your values or vice versa? What's the relationship? I think your intuition influences your values and some of your lived experience, which is why it's good to go through it with other people and not just on your own so that you, people can call out where those little creepy negative beliefs are lurking, uh, which is another thing that, that really we have to do if we want to evolve. But I think that when you've got clear about what is what your actual values are, right? And which ones that also you feel like you wanna be today, um, you know, then I do think that, I think that's those, those true values come from your intuition. Because even when you don't know what your values are, your, uh, you will know when you've taken a step outside them, right? You feel uncomfortable. For some people, their stomach flips over, their heart starts racing. Like it's in your body. It, you will freak out when you feel like you're doing something that's against your values. Um, and that is, I think though, Matt, where a lot of, lot of us struggle in the people role because sometimes we're in cultures and environments where things are happening that are not in alignment with our values. And we're having to do this dance within ourselves of, whoa, you know, like I'm deeply uncomfortable within myself, but actually I'm not in control of this. So I, I then have a choice. Is this something that I can support the company to at least do this the best possible way with? Or do I need to admit to myself that actually this environment moving forward will not be a place where I, I'm gonna get to be my values? and live live as me. And what about for people managers? So a lot in our community, there's a lot of people who have become managers because they were great at what they did and now they're a manager. So we've looked a lot at leadership. In based on your experience, if there's a people team who find that managers in the company are first time managers, what's was one of the first steps you would take as a people team to address that like that development need yeah um i would well it depends on how big your team is right and how confident you feel in this area right but if you feel confident that you know what good leadership looks like um you know then there's no reason why you couldn't be putting together training that's super effective as a as a as a jump off point right um but there are some other like hacks that you can do too, which is things like having like a team leaders meetup, which is quite a, quite a good thing. 
Um, what I did because my team didn't have the bandwidth to deliver it in my last role, I used um, a company called Mavericks Unlimited, which is Hassan Care. Um, and um, we basically offered our portfolio their managers training and had them host a monthly meetup with all the leads from the companies across our portfolio, right? So there's lots of different ways that you can hack it. But if you're asking like, what does what needs to be in that? I mean, for me, leadership development of any sort has to start with who you are and what why you are. So I can't even start it without doing that. Yes, I can, I can definitely go into the concepts of how to be a better leader. You definitely want to talk about the, the, the toxic things that show up in our relationships with each other. You definitely want to help them to be it, understand the intricacies of psychological safety and how they create it and build it in others. You want them to learn how to build relationships. But then you also want them to learn, hey, you should be having one-on-ones this often and here's a rough structure. And you know, like you definitely want to give them the, the nitty gritty. But for me, the ultimate nitty gritty is who you are, why you are, and being self-aware about how you're showing up to other people and what you're doing that you don't realize you're doing to squish people around you. Because most of the time, like when I'm working with leaders, I work with both sides. I work with those who, who need to learn how to take up space. And I work with those who need to learn to be more careful about the space that they're taking up. <laughs> It's such a it's such a good little tip about the creating the cohorts for people to learn from each other. And yeah, you describe the nitty gritty as like understanding yourself and having that self awareness. And yeah, I think that's profound enough, isn't it, and for life, not just for work. This has been a brilliant kind of introductory conversation to the topic. So thank you so much, Ruth. If someone's listening and thinks, okay, I uh, if they want to like write that LinkedIn message to you saying. Um, love what you do um curious to understand more about your work um other than connecting on linkedin is there anywhere else people can go yeah well so obviously linkedin i'm probably the only ruth penfold brown so you're okay now that i've added the brown like no, i'm a, it's like my own little trademark so <laughs> i'm probably the only one but you know you never know um and then my website for bloom is our time to bloom.com so if you want to find out more about that you can hop on there and have a look and i often am sharing freebies and frameworks and different tools to really help you get ahead so definitely reach out to me just say that you heard the pod and we will arrange some time to say hello i absolutely guarantee it <laughs> And Matt, I do want to say to you, thank you so much for having me on this brilliant podcast because you said at the beginning about my generosity. I honestly think you are a shining light in this world. And every single time that I've seen you or spoken to you, it has been an utter joy. So thank you. I appreciate you. And 